Let's, let's begin with prayer before we have the message this morning. Father, I come before you today, Lord, thanking you for another opportunity to come together to study your word, to seek out your face, to seek out your will. Lord, I pray for families today. Lord, the family is in trouble today, and it's an evidence of the news stories that we read. Father, I pray that you would uh, bring order to the families, bring the hearts of the fathers again to the children, and the children's hearts again to the fathers. Father, I pray that you would restore order in the family, and Lord, these are in our midst today. We pray that they would uh, get information today that would help their family to be in order, that the, the mother, the father, or the children even would be able to uh, harvest, Father, today wisdom for riches riches and glory, Father, to glorify your name and to glorify their family name. And we pray, Father, today, Lord, that you would give us understanding in the Word of God. Open our minds, Father, that we may see. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, this is uh, part five in my, my message is called God's Plan for a Happy Home. You don't have to raise your hands. In fact, I hope you don't raise your hands. And I would like to ask everybody here a question. Is your home happy? Is there order and peace and harmony in your home? Or is there strife, arguing, dissension, bitterness, jealousy, rage, yelling, screaming, weeping, and gnashing of teeth? In your home today, think about it. If your home is not one of peace, if your home today is not one that has harmony, now I'm not talking about the chaos that happens just when you have life going on in your home, but I'm talking about the regular peace that should happen in your home. That joy that you wake up every morning knowing that you're safe and sound, knowing that God has saved you from hell, knowing that your family is set on course, that God has a plan for you, all the things that Christians should know. Is your, is your family in order today? And if not, why isn't it? We have been given everything we need right here. Everything we need is in this book. If you're not following this, if you want to go your own way, you're going to be sad to find out that it will not find, you will not find peace. You will not find happiness or joy. You will not find harmony in life. You will not find your life's dreams and all the things you think is good in your life. You will not find those things. You know the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for many is an outhouse. No. I mean, really, we, we think that we're going to go out there to some dream and some goal in life, but aside from the, part, the plan of God in our lives, we think we're going to head out there and it's going to be wonderful. It's heaven on earth for us. We just want to have this or that, this thing or that person in our lives, this freedom or this uh, ability to do something in our lives. We think that if we get that, we're going to be completely happy. And we must do it. And we're going to put all our effort into it. And when we get there, we're going to be shocked. You know, Adam and Eve was that way. They had everything good. Everything good in the didn't they not? Everything, everything they had was good, and the only thing they didn't have was bad. And so the enemy came up and said, "You're missing out. Think about it. You're missing out. Oh, you're missing all the fun in life." And the only thing he could offer them was bad. And he said. That fruit that God has said, did he really say that? Did he really say that? And they began to put doubt in, in the Adam and Eve's mind and said, is that really? Is it really? You know what? If you've got those doubts going on, they're from the devil. If you've got those thoughts going on in your head, you may have heard them from your best friend, some buddy down the road, but if you've got those doubts in your mind, they're from the devil. He just used that person as a tool, as a messenger. Those things that get to create doubt, you know, you don't really have to do all that. You don't really have to serve God to be happy. You don't really have to have your family based on the Word of God. You don't really have to do all that. Really? Does that really say that? 
I feel sorry for you if that's the direction you're headed. Your family, the disorder in your family right now is because of going that direction. You may not have stepped off the cliff, you may not have stepped out the door, but your family, the, the disharmony in your family today is because of going in that direction just a little bit. Just thinking about it. Adam and Eve, when they stood there in front of that fruit, they probably passed it for days, weeks, months, years. It, it was right there for them. But it was established as bad. We got a, a wood stove over there that heats this warm up this room up beautifully, and I'd say it's about 80 degrees in here this morning, and a, a balmy 80 degrees, is it not? You know, I mean, we we've got a nice wood stove over there, but if you go over there and you lay your hand on the top of it, it, it will burn you. I never never think about walking by there and putting my hand on that. It never crosses my mind. But years ago, I was told, "Don't touch that; it's hot." as a child and I didn't listen it's so pretty it looks so nice is that really something I should be listening you know thinking about if you can establish something is it's just wrong it's just going to be wrong it's always going to be wrong it's hot it's always going to be hot if you can establish those things in your life this thing right here this book is established it is proven and tested it worked in families for thousands of years it will work for your family it's truth. There's a lot of things today that are being taught as truth that are not truth. There are situation uh, ethics of whatever's right at this time. If, if you need to steal, then it's okay to steal. If you need to lie, then it's okay to lie. If the situation presents itself, it's best for you, then you can do that. That's not what God's Word says. Truth is what you need to be telling. You do not need to steal. You do not need to kill. You do not need to covet what your neighbor has. You need to be happy where you are. That's what this word says. I've been going through for four messages talking about the order of the family. And I've talked primarily about the structure, the roles of everybody in it. The mothers, the fathers, or actually the wives and the husbands. I've talked in general about the harmony in the family. We've gone through the goals, the leadership, the order, um, and I haven't brought up the children yet. So children, this is your day. This is the day when you children are going to be given what the Word of God says for you because you have a responsibility. Now the little ones over here, obviously they, they don't understand what I'm talking about. Mom and Dad, it's up to you to, under, to help them understand that, that what this says. Children that are old enough to understand, all of you younger ones even, this is for you, and you are responsible before God to listen to it. Okay, We're going to start off in Galatians 1.28 just to begin with and think about the family unit and what it's all about. And I hope that I'm able to make myself clear this morning because I know a lot of times I say things that I don't fully describe or explain, and sometimes later I'll get questions and I'll realize that I did not say it fully. So I'm going to try to really be thorough this morning. Genesis 128. Actually, let's look at 27 and 28. <coughs> Genesis or Galatians? Genesis. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. First, first verse we're looking at here, first passage, is all about God's original plan, and that was for men and women to have children, for families to include children for there to be one male, one female, and children. And when I'm looking at this, I realize that a lot of families can't have children. I understand that. And I don't, I want to, that's one of the things I said earlier, I want to fully under, help you understand. If you can't have children, you know, I understand that. And God understands that. But God's plan for happiness in your life, for the fulfillment of your life, His perfect plan is for you to have children. Okay? So this was this is like page two of my Bible. Actually, it's just it is the second page in my Bible of text 
So this is kind of early on, isn't it? This is like 6,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. During creation or whenever Moses wrote this down is when this was recorded. And this, is sh this shows us God's plan. That it, that it was his original plan for mankind to have one man, one woman, and children. All right, let's turn to Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi 2.15. This confirms, this one confirms what the first one said, Malachi 2.15. And did he not, excuse me, and did not he make one, yet he had the residue of the Spirit? And wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. This passage is talking about God's plan for you to have godly seed. Not just children, but godly children. His plan is for you to have children and to have godly children. So parents, this is your mandate to make sure your children are godly children. Um, now I want to move on into um, Ephesians 6, which is where we've spent a good deal of our time talking about the order of the family. Ephesians 6. We're going to look at uh, 1 through 4 in this passage. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. All right, children, this is your passage. Not very complicated, not hard to do, doesn't require a lot of study, but it does require obedience. There's two things, children, that you're supposed to do here. First, you're supposed to obey your parents. And whenever I talk about this, I say, what about, well, what about, like when I was a youth pastor, well, what, Brother Paul, what about, I mean, don't we really do that? We're trying to find a loophole in this. We're trying to find, you know, does that mean I have to always obey them? What if I really don't agree with them? What if I, what if I think I'm big enough to make my own mind up? You know, this guy right here, he thinks he's big enough to make his own mind up. Doesn't he? I mean, y'all have all seen it. He, I mean, he, was he two and a half? Three, yeah. I mean, he thinks he's big enough to make his own mind up. If it was, if he was given his way, he'd take a key, go out there, and drive that tractor around in circles. You know, because in his mind, he's grown up. You know, you younger kids that understand what I'm talking about. You know, all of you believe you're grown up, and you're not. You know, you're under your parents' guide, you're under your parents' wisdom, and your mandate for right now is children, obey your parents. It's pretty simple. And why do we find it so hard to do? But I can tell you, I have a hard time as I entered my teen years listening to my dad. Because I felt like I was pretty grown up. You know, at 13 years old, I could drive a truck around the farm. You know, 14, I earned enough money to buy my own motorcycle, which gave me freedom. I could hit the road and go out, but I still was under rules. Mm -hmm. I didn't just hit the road and go out because I wanted to. I had to tell my mom where I was going to my friend's house down the road or whatever. I was going to school every day on it. And, you know, whatever, at 14 years old, even though I had a little bit of freedom, I still had to be under their guidance. You know, 15 years old, well, I'm getting really big now. I can... I can drive a car as long as there's somebody else sitting beside me. You know, you think about it. As you get in, into the older years and your teen years, you you do have a little more freedom. But as long as you're under mom and dad's rule, they are responsible for you. And God says, obey your parents. You know, why why is that hard? I don't know. I guess it's our it's our flesh. You know, our natural man wants to do what it wants to do. And you can see from an early age, it's in us. It's in us. And we, as in comparison, we toward God are the same way. 
God said, don't lie. Don't steal. And we want to reach over and maybe he won't catch me. Or I tell this lie, maybe he won't hear it. You know, we, we still are that way toward God. And children, obey your parents. The second thing you have to do besides obeying your parents is honor your father and mother. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. Now what does honor mean? Think about it. Well, I'd like to hear one of the young people tell me what honor means. What does it mean to honor something? Respect it. Respect it. Any other words come to mind? Okay, respect. Some of you grown-ups, any words come to mind on honor? Respect is good. Not embarrassed. Not embarrassed, yeah. Not embarrassing. Right. I've got uh, re reverence, um, even um, glorify or to make them look good, right? So he said to honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So this commandment given in the Ten Commandments is the first commandment that's given has a promise attached to it. What is the promise? Everybody look down and tell me what the promise is if you honor your father and mother. Verse 3. Live a long life. And what's the other thing? That it may be well with thee. Okay, so what does it mean to be to grow be well with thee? I actually went back to the original words as I often do. And that means that your life will be blessed. Your life will be blessed. Your life will be blessed and you will live many years. Live a long life. Well, that really follows in logic. And we could say, well, that's not really a spiritual thing. If your parents tell you to stay out of the road, and you stay out of the road, then you do live a long life. But this is just not talking about safety rules, is it? I mean, this is really, honoring your father and mother is talking about bringing respect to your family name. You know, think about how you, younger, younger people, how you bring respect to your family name. If there was a news story written about you, and they knew all about your life, would it embarrass your family? The Aniston Star decided to put a family, put a story out about you, you kids. Each of you, would your, would your story, would your life honor your family? Would your mom and dad be proud of it? Older people too, because we're supposed to honor our parents. Our lives should be something that honors them. If it should be something that makes their name sound good. You know, the family name. We used to hear a lot about the family name. You know, don't taint the family name. Keep the family name clean. Uh, people are very embarrassed when their children end up in the news because they've committed crimes, because it's the, you know, the Jones family or the Burrell family or the, you know, Rickenbacker family or whatever your family name is. If, that, if that's your name and you, your family name is on the news, it's, it's a shameful thing. And why is it a shameful thing? Because you're supposed to be obeying and honoring your parents. And when you do that, you grow up with respect, you grow up with maturity, and you grow out and go out, go out in the world, and you glorify their name, so to speak. Okay, so we are supposed to honor our parents. Um, verse 4, so we're, since we're looking at the relationship of the parents and the children. Verse 4 says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, this is pointed to you. Of course, mothers also, um, obviously if it's right for fathers, mothers shouldn't be doing provoking their children either, but fathers especially, this is written to you, to not provoke your children to wrath. Now why do you think it says that? We had a little discussion earlier we talked about it was just in, you know, uh, part of the curse. It was in women to to always want to be ruler over their husband. Your desire shall be to your husband, right? I mean, that's what the word says. To Eve, he said, your desire will be up toward your husband. And and I know that's part of the the curse and natural man or natural woman to want to they have to overcome is wanting to be in charge, wanting to be the lead. God set the man to be the lead. 
when men won't lead, women have to on, uh, sometimes. But men are supposed to be leaders. They're supposed to be leading their families. Fathers, he said not to provoke your children to wrath. Well, so how do you provoke your children to wrath? Think about things that that um, you may have done uh, to intimidate your children. Fathers, think about things you've said to them, attitudes, moods, body language. Anybody ever seen it? this threatening your children? And you know, men men can be very scary to their children. You're much bigger than they are. You're, I mean, you could really hurt them really badly by losing your temper. Fathers, we have to be careful about that, provoking our children to wrath. I think about um, someone who takes a, a stick and they start punching at a dog with it, thinking it's fun playing with the dog. And uh, Olivia used to work in a vet, and she saw animals that had been treated that way, and she understood that that's what had happened. You know that that dog had been abused, and it is abuse if you are threatening your children, if you are provoking your children. But I'll give you a little a little personal example in my life. There was a time in my life when all I could tell my children was no. Sarah, this is your chance to say amen. No, I mean we really. I just I found it easier, quicker. Daddy, can we do this? Can we get one of these? Can we, please, whatever? And no. No, we're not going to do that. No, 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 no. I could have easily just hung the sign up on the door, no. And the child would have just lost hope with me. I did a message uh, a few months ago where I talked about that for everything you say no in, you need to say yes in something. And that came about because of my own experience. If you tell your children no to everything dad's, you've eventually got to tell them yes and something. they they got to be allowed to do something. And I realize we as fathers have to limit our children. We have to tell them no for a lot of things. There's a lot of things they want to do. Can I drive the tractor around? No. But you can play in the sandbox. Right? We have to say, suggest something else for them to do. Dad, can we go to the museum? No. But we can go to get an ice cream. You know, we need to understand, fathers, that saying no to everything in a way is a, there is a way to provoke them. There are other ways too, but if you are always negative toward them, not personal toward them, not wanting to find out the heart of your child, you can provoke them to wrath. My father doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't understand me. You are provoking them. They will turn for love somewhere. Children want to be loved and they will be loved somewhere. We have to make sure that we are not provoking them. <clears throat> but he said, instead of provoking your children to wrath, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I looked up nurture. Bringing them up means to train or to raise them. And nurture... I wrote down all of this, and it's pretty lengthy, so bear with me. I was, I was really surprised how lengthy it was. The whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of minds and morals and employs for this purpose reproof and punishment. That's part one. Also, nurture means whatever in adults also cultivate the soul by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. Instruction which aims at increasing virtue, chastisement, and chastening. Chastisement and chastening. I always hated those words when I was a kid. Didn't want to be chastised. We didn't we didn't say chastised down here in the South. It was a whipping. Going to get a whipping, boy. You know? And I really hated it when one of my parents said, go out to the hedge bush and break me off. They called it a hickory. Break me off a hickory. Did you ever get a hickory? You know about that? And if you come back, you know, with a with a goose feather or something, you know, rotted or whatever, uh, that won't do. Now I'm going to get to go out and get one. And mom or dad went out, and you didn't want them to go out and get, get a limb off of the little hedge bush uh, because 
it, they would get a serious one. Mm -hmm. They would get one that was serious. And I knew that that meant it was over with. My life as I knew it was over with. I was about to get the punishment. And why did I get that punishment? Why did we get chastised? Why did we get corrected and disciplined? So we'll learn a lesson. We're out of control, right? Um, I like the one where it said instruction which aims in increasing virtue. I thought about doing an experiment today, but I think I'll save this to a later day, where we look at virtues. Fathers, what kind of virtues do you want in your children? Think about it. What kind of virtues can you think of? You know, the shallow father says, I don't even know what a virtue is. What is a virtue? You know, what kind of traits do you want your children to have? Well, I want them to be able to um, grow up and race motocross. I want them to be football fans. That's not a virtue. I'm sorry to tell you that dads, that's, a lot of times that's the way we think. That's not a virtue. It's not a virtue to be a great fly fisherman. It is not a virtue to be a great woodcarver. What is a virtue that you want your child to grow up with? And I'll tell you this, when you said it, the devil will lock horns with you and he say, that's the one I'm going to fight you about. One of mine was that our children always tell the truth. I want my children, if they don't do anything else right, I want them to be truthful. Oh, could they lie? Oh, <laughs> did they not come up with some whoppers and sit there and look you right in the face and go, no, I didn't do that. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? And years later, find out, I, I really wasn't telling the truth. <laughs> you know? And when you set your, your mind up, the enemy will come against you in that virtue. But you need to set virtues that you want your children to have. And I will, I will challenge you to find ten virtues that you want your children to have. You want them to be honest. You want them to be truthful. Want them to be sincere, want them to be kind, want them to be loving, want them to be reverent. You know, think about those kind of things. Those are virtues. Those are the traits that parents are skipping today in training their children in. Instead, we want them to know all about Star Wars. We want them to take them to every Star Wars thing so they'll know all the characters from Luke Skywalker to Jabba the Hutt. And they can know they can name every minor character and quote every line in the movie. But they can't tell you two Bible verses. Shame on us, church. Fathers, it's your job, not the pastor's job, not the Sunday school teacher's job. It's your job to make sure that those virtues are instilled in your children. So you have, that is your job. You have the job to not provoke them to wrath, but instead to, treat, to train them up, to nurture them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the whole training of education of children which relates to the cultivation of minds and morals and employs for this purpose reproof and punishment. Now, that is a pretty broad area of training in your child's life. What have we done in the past? We have let, Mom, that's your job. I go to work. I get home. It's your job to teach them if you're homeschooling. It's your job to teach them if not public school. It's your job to get them on the bus. It's your job to keep the house clean. It's your job. It's your job. It's your job. All I'm going to do is break money. And it's your job to raise the children. No. The Bible says, fathers, it is your job. Now, years ago, when I was, uh, my children were all in, in homeschool, different ages, I had the enlightenment that one day I was no longer just the principal, which I really liked, the principal of our homeschool. You know, one day I, I saw a, a brochure that she'd written up from a meeting that doing and had my name by it. It said, Principal of Shepherd's Hill Homeschool. Principal. That means, you know, if you get you do really bad, you go to the principal, you know, and I have a paddle. And that was, <coughs> that was what I thought was my job. Otherwise, she did all the work. I took all the glory as the principal. And one day she said, honey, you know, I really need some help in teaching the children I can, I can remember the, my eyes shifting around and, you know, my heart beating real fast and thinking, um, uh, I don't know if I can do that or not. 
And then I began to come up with excuses. You know, I work a lot. A lot. I work long hours. and I'm tired when I get in. You know, as if she didn't. You know, she's there with children all day. And, and I had that thought that I didn't have to do anything. And lo and behold, she asked me to teach science, which I dearly love. And I taught science. And it made a connection with me and my children. So dads, what connection do you have with your children? What kind of role do you have in your children's life? I'm not talking about, you know, you like to build model airplanes together. I'm talking about a real connection. Because everybody can come up with a, um, a hobby that you do with your children. And that's good. That's good to have those hobbies. But you need to make sure you have a heart-to-heart -heart connection. I remember the exact intersection in Gadsden, Alabama, and I remember the green truck my dad was driving, and he pulled up to this red light, and he was waiting on it to change, and my dad turned to me and said, Son, who's Lord of your life? I remember the exact moment in time that that happened. That made a great impact on my life. My dad may not even remember that today, but I remember that. That has stuck with me my whole life. That was a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I had a lot of siblings, but my dad took time with me. He, he spent time with me. That, and I, I know you have a lot of children. You're, you're working there. You're working on it. You know, When you have a lot of children, you have to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them, dads. It's not setting them all out there and, you know, okay, I'm going to present this to the general audience, just kind of over the top of the head. You need to take them one at a time and spend some time with them. Do it on their birthday, you know, pick a special time. Make sure that you make time for every child that you have and that you connect with them, not just a, I just happen to be in the principal in the office that if you need me for the paddling, that's all I do. Because to be honest, growing up, that's my idea of a principal in a high school. You only saw him when you was in trouble. He was the authoritative figure that stood there in the hallway and watched you go by, and you did not know him, and you did not dare speak to him. And if you was called in, you knew it was bad. Dads, don't be the principal of, of your child's life. Be their parent. There's a difference. Be their parent. And while I'm mentioning that, I would like to say, don't be your child's friend. Now, that shocks a lot of people. God didn't call you to be your child's friend. They will have friends in life. He called you to be their parent. So it is your job, parents, to be a parent. I have watched numerous families fall apart because the mother or the father or both wanted just, just wanted to be... I just, my mom just was not a, a friend to me. I'm just going to decide I'm going to be a friend to my daughter. I'm going to be their friend. No. They ruined their children. Their children grew up with a wrong attitude <coughs> about parenting, a wrong attitude about everything, with no respect for the parent, because eventually they will push you. Eventually you will have to make an authoritative decision. And they will be shocked because you was my friend and now you're acting like somebody else. Don't ever get in that position. Don't put yourself in the position of friend of your child. You are their parent. You are their parent. And I'm running out of time. Um, while we're there, Proverbs 22.6. While we're on this thought, rather. 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. This is a very familiar passage to a lot of Christian families. I felt obligated to to go through it. It says, "Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it." So parents, especially fathers, is your ultimate responsibility, fathers, to train up a child in the way he should go. Now, what does it mean to train up your children? I remember being a young dad and thinking about career choices for my son, career choices for 
what your child would be when they grow up, what you want to ultimately, you know, train them to be. Of occupations, that's not what this is. Because we can, we can slant them towards some occupation. You know, I mean, I work in technology. I work in um, computers and networks and telecommunications and radio and uh, all kind of data devices that I could have really pumped into my children. I could have brought back, brought them, brought home from work all the books, done the slideshow and the presentation, get the laser pointer out. I could have raised my children in that, or could raise them in some hobby, or could raise them in some skill. Like we teach heritage skills. Basket making, pottery, blacksmithing, whatever your heritage skills you like. That's not what this is talking about. This is not preparing your child to make it in the world with an occupation. This is training them for wholesomeness. Training them for goodness. The term, I looked it up in the Hebrew, the term actually means to train them to nurse, to breastfeed. That's what this means. Does that shock anybody? Mm -hmm. That's what that means. It means to get them to breastfeed. Well, we've, I counted up. We had seven children in the last five, seven grandchildren in the last five years. Have we not? Mm -hmm. and, and over and over again, we watched young moms wanting, deciding ahead of time to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And when we did, I watched them studying as, as a man, studying as looking at this aspect of life, that those mothers had made their minds up ahead of time before the baby was ever born, right? And those young mothers had worked and they struggled when the baby was born. It wasn't just automatic like you think about. And we birth animals all the time. We have sheep and goats and, and, and you know all kind of farm animals that we see. And we have to help them. We understand that. You know, it's not just an automatic thing. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But we always know that we have to check that. Parents, you need to decide ahead of time, and those of you with children already, you know, you need to backtrack up if you haven't done this and plan on how you're going to train your children in the Lord, how you're going to give them an appetite. Now, I remember the struggle some of the girls had in getting their babies to nurse, and it was a panic. What are we going to do? It's not working. It's not happening. Am I going to have to give my child formula and give them bottles? I don't want to give my child formula. A dedication that requires work and effort. That's what this is talking about. This verse means to get them to nurse, get them to eat, feed them the right things, don't feed them the bad things. The whole point of breastfeeding is it's natural. It's God's God's way, God's best. You don't have to give them some kind of man-made formula that you don't know what's in there. You're stuck with that. It's not what's supposed to be in there. It's what some scientist thought your child needed to grow up on. So I mean, you look at that logically and say this is the best way. And when you look at this, and when you look at this verse, train up a child in the way he should go, which way is that? What is that way, parents, that your children need to go? What is that direction? What is that ultimate goal, the ultimate virtue, as I said, that you need to train your children to give them an appetite for it? Think about this. Let's just pick one virtue. Think about being charitable. If you, if you say, you know what, I want my children to be charitable. I don't want them to be stingy. I want my children to be loving and giving and kind to people that have less than us. Do they see you doing it? Do they see Dad giving? Do they see Dad reaching for his wallet anytime you know that you're going by somebody that needs money? Do, you, do they see Dad and know that Dad gives money? Do they see Mom giving money? Do they see Mom, you know, visiting the nursing home and? All the stuff we do in charity, taking care of, of the widows and the orphans, do they see their parents doing that? That's how they're going to learn, Mom and Dad. If you want them to know a virtue, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to demonstrate that for them. The same way we get a baby to nurse, we have to point them toward it, right? I mean, really, we have to guide them in that direction. 
So guide your children in the virtues that you want them to have. The last thing I want to talk about, for time's sake, is is uh, discipline and punishment. Uh, Proverbs 22:15. We're already in that chapter. Proverbs 22:15. It says, "Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him." I believe if uh, if you ask my children what was the most quoted verse in our house years ago, they would have said this one. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. I could start that and they could finish it. The rod, they knew the rod of correction was about to happen. Okay. <coughs> there are so many parents that believe that they've got a better way, that that's just abuse. Well, I was spanked and I didn't like it. Did anybody like, I mean, anybody here, raise your hand, did you like being spanked as a child? Livia did. <laughs> no, you didn't. You know, we that's not pleasurable, is it? In fact, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to show you one thing in here about punishment. He's, he's talking about God and his relationship to us. Hebrews 12. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are all all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but, we, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift ye up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. This is, this is talking about that God chastens his own sons. And if he doesn't, then you're illegitimate and you're not his sons at all. Right? And he's comparing our earthly fathers, that the earthly fathers chastened us. Our earthly fathers spanked us. Our earthly fathers used correction on us. And going back to the, the rod of correction, talking about that, we have, a, we have a misnomer taken out of, or a misquoted scripture taken out of Proverbs, where we say, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's not what it says. It says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. That's what it says. And we misquote it and say, spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, here, this agrees with it. Because he said, I mean, our earthly fathers did it. And nobody enjoys it while it's going on. And if God didn't love us, he wouldn't be doing it for us. I mean, if you read through that passage, he's doing it because he loves us. Now, dads, you get it out of control. You hurt your child, that's wrong. There's no reason to hurt your child as far as damage your child. I'm talking about spanking, rod of correction, whatever it takes to get their attention. Different children, different things. Some of them, the pop is humiliating. They understand it. It's embarrassing to them. And for some, it's going to take a switching on the back of the back of the seat or the legs I mean I got out of control my dad straightened me out I understood I understood when he said no he meant no when we tell our children don't do that I'm gonna spank you don't do that I'm gonna spank you don't do that I'm gonna spank you don't do that I said don't do it don't do it don't do it don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it. when are we going to quit telling them that and just do it they have learned that we don't really mean what we say if we tell them if you do that one more time, 
you're never going to eat again. You know, we say stupid things like that. We give them some punishment that we, if we had thought about it, we had never have said that. You know, you need to be in control when you're disciplining your children. Be in control. And I'm running out of time, but I would like to say that parents, you're the grown-ups. You are the grown-ups, and we need to act like it. I have seen parents, I remember a day when I let my children intimidate me, when I would let them make me mad and push my buttons, and I'd push their buttons back. And instead of acting like the, the mature adult in the situation, I got down on their level. You will never win when you do that. You won't win when you act like a child among children. You need to act like the grown-up. We let children manipulate us sometimes, and they say, I don't love you anymore. They cross their arms, put your lift out. And I've seen parents go, oh, I don't want that. Oh, I want you to love me. Oh, I care so much for you. I'm not going to let that happen between you. I'll do anything. You've just caved in and come down to their level. Mm -hmm. You have just come down to their level wanting to be their friend. The proper response is, you don't really mean that, and I don't really care what you say right now because you're still not going out. You know? Well, you know what? I'm the grown-up here, and you're just not going to do it. It's just not. A, there's no question about it. There's no discussion. You know, we need to be grown-ups in this and stop acting like children with our children. That is a huge problem in families today. Is children are given free reign. Parents, find something to do with your children that will cause a connection. We have a problem with modern technology that separates us instead of brings us together. You know, everybody sitting in the same room doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, hey mom, what's for supper? And mom replies back, I don't know, I have to get up and go find something. And when we, and when we eat, we're in every room of the house. You know, because everybody's got their own television, you go to every room of the house. And when you never sit, to get, sit down and have conversation, your, your idea of family time is a movie in which you all sit and stare in one screen. Tell me, what kind of connection have you just made with your child? Even something like going out and walking in the woods. Think about it. Taking a hike, going camping, going fishing, going somewhere where you enjoy something, where you can experience something together. Television is not it, folks. You will not have an experience of television to bring your family closer together. The proof is in modern family sits and watches television and never speak to each other. And look what's happening in the news. You read about young people that are getting into trouble constantly. They have no connection with their parents. You know, dad's out of the picture. The family is not according to God's word. The family's out of control. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for what we've seen in your word today. I pray for parents today that need order in their home, that they would have uh, the wisdom that comes from your word, that they would have the Holy Spirit to guide them, that they would desperately seek the path for, to train their children up in. I pray for children today, Lord, that they would be obedient to their parents, that they would see that uh, that even one child among a large family can cause such strife in a family and cause such dissension. And that one child's harmony can be brought in by simple obedience. Help us, Father, to work as a family that we might present the gospel of Christ to the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before I finish and before we um, turn off the broadcast, um, I'd like to hear some discussion or some questions or some comments about all of this and not just today's message but um, any of the other ones that you have, questions about family, you know, you can give them generic or whatever. What, what's, your, uh, what's your thoughts on the structure of the family according to God's Word and, and uh, maybe you've got some some um, observations that you've had of your family or other families that that you realize things were out. You didn't have to name names, but just 
you know, any thoughts? I have one. Okay. When you say about the inner plot, you talk about the grandparents or the second grandparents, mom with us, mom with us. She has dementia. But it's not to say she still takes care of herself, but she does like little things like. Like she almost caught the kitchen on fire the day because, you know, Jody walked in and she said, Mom, the poster's um, on fire. And I was like, what? Mother had walked off. So with her, I kind of make excuses sometimes for some of the things she does because I feel like her mind is not there, you know? Yeah. And then, so how, and how do you honor or grandparents who just blatantly disrespect you as a parent? That's a good good question, and it it comes down to ultimately parents are responsible for their children and their home. And I, I failed to mention that it said parents and the Lord, which means the person that has your their responsibility over you. And I take that to mean even if your if your children happen to be staying at like when I was when I was young, it was that way. If I went to my friend's house from after school and spend the night, his parents had the right to correct me. You know, if I acted up in that house, they would spank me, and they'd send me home. They'd tell my dad, uh, had to spank him last night because he, you know, got wild, and I couldn't calm him down, and you know, and that was that was just understood that whoever you, whoever's control you was under, they had the responsibility for you. In the case where you have extended family that are maybe not respecting your wishes, I, I understand that. Um, you have to. Do whatever it takes because your first responsibility and priority is to your children. Even if it means separating, you know, I, you know, we don't like divisiveness in families, but it says that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So that's leaving and cleaving. So if you've got um, the, the 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 dad's parents or dad's mother who's interfering. He's supposed to leave. He's supposed to, his his role is to leave and cleave. Okay, and um, it's a hard thing to do, but you are responsible before God for the way your children turn out, and you have to make sure that whatever it takes, you're going to make your children let your children see growing up and respecting that. Uh, you you do have to. When you said making excuses, I don't really see it as making excuses if your if your parents are feeble and old. They do. They have to be understood, just like right. you understand them. Right. She, she'll argue with a mother, my mother. Right. Would argue with like last night. I had a can of pet milk. I mean, it was sweet condensed milk, which is generic pet right. milk. We're talking about pumpkin pies. Mother's like, you cannot use that. It has to be pet milk. I'm like, mother, it's sweet condensed milk. It says it right here. No, that's not it. I'm like. Yes, it is. And we went round and round in the kitchen, and then she was just like, oh, okay. And I was like, all right, you know, right. whatever. Okay. We actually had a discussion about adult children honoring and obeying their parents the other day. And uh, I believe in my in my life, my mother is not in my life. Right. Um, it is not possible for me to obey what my mother would suggest to me. Right. But my life, I believe, to the depths of my soul, my life honors my mother. Right. And I can't tell you how many times people have written me, and we would be back and forth. Time they say, "Your mother must be so proud of you." And in my heart, I know that if my mother was standing in front of me, she wouldn't have a bit of pride in me. But she could have. Because my life has shown an effort to godliness. And that's what I bear in mind as far as honoring my mother and my father. My father passed away. I have not brought disgrace. I have not. I think I have honored greatly what 
my mother's true heart would have been for me. Right. You understand what right. I'm saying? So when we have a, as adults, as parents ourselves, when we have a parent that things are not lining up with, we have to truly do what our God shows us is the right way. Now, where our kids are involved, break it off, break it off. Any influence in their life that is destructive to them, that has to stop. That has to be done. Because, like Paul said, whatever your children turn out to be because of your influence or somebody else's influence is going to be accountable to you. And, um, yeah. We had influences try to come into our children's lives that would have drawn them away and we had to end it. And it was hurtful to everybody, but there was no it's just like if you put your kids out in the yard where you see a bunch of rattlesnakes crawling around. Yes, they share in sunlight is great. But if those snakes are out there, they're gonna hurt your kids. Right. And you can't put them out there. You'll have to just keep them in the house. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. Not to call people right. rattlesnakes, but right. you get my point. And if your 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 children just can't risk it. You just can't risk it. I found a couple other proverbs, um, 23, 13, and 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. It's it's serious about. I mean, and again, not to abuse your children. That is not godly to leave marks on your children. And we, we hopefully we all understand that. But physical correction of your child is ordered by God to save them from hell. Because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Okay? So understand, you're not going to be one of these modern I, I'm not ever going to lay a hand on my child. I'm going to I'm going to uh just reason with them. You're not going to be able to reason with your child. There's a there's a point when they're hopefully mature enough that you can reason with them, but you have to get them to that point where they're actually respecting you and listening to you. And when children become teenagers, you don't whip them. And that's a southern term, I realize. But there are other ways to discipline teenage kids. And I, I am a firm believer when a, a child gets to the point where they think they know better than you, you've got to use some intelligence to reveal to that child what their end is going to be. And when you think, and, uh, and I've said it a thousand times, people don't think. They don't think out the process of what they're doing. They react instead of thinking in advance. And um, it's important to, especially father and mother, to have serious conversations about their kids, not just one of them saying, why don't you help me? Well, I don't know what to do. Blah, 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 and bicker back and forth. I mean, serious, put your heads together and figure out what you're going to do. You know what I mean? Right. Don't let the kid rule the roost. And that's one thing I mentioned in the text message, but I didn't say it today, and I will say it, is parents have to, you, you have to band together. You have to be on the same page. Do not let your children divide you. That's because right. if, if one of your kids can say, well, mom's on my side, They'll, they'll put a wedge between you. You stay together at all costs. Even if your children end up walking away, you stay together at all costs. Your child will come back. If you separate, there's no hope for you. Your child can always be the prodigal that will come back someday. But husbands and wives should stay together. They should be on the same, in agreement and on the same page. And children should never be allowed to separate them. And you know, it's that sin nature in kids to try to divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, we all start out that way. We want what we want. Right. And we, yeah, you have to bring them into submission to the Lord. Because in the end, no matter what a person may contrive in their mind that this is the way it is, they will eternally be damned. Right. You know, and when you look at it that way, it's not I want to do it my way. I want to do it this way. As a parent, you know that your child will spend eternity in the flames of hell, and there will be no opinion one way or the other. Am I burnt to a crisp yet, or am I just thinking I'm burning? No. 
You're really burning. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. You are really on fire. So everything I need to do to save you from that, I'm going to do. But ultimately, that child will reach an age of accountability, and it will then be their choice. They will condemn themselves. But you got to do everything you got to do to, to prevent it. Because it's a hard day that you get to when you realize there's nothing you can do to help them. Once you make one mistake, it's always there. You can't ever take it back. Yeah. You can't it, yeah. ever take it back. You mean as a child growing up? Yeah. Yeah. Even, if, even if nobody else knows about it, you still do. Right. You still do. That's right. And, you know, saying, well, God knows about it. Yes, and that should be something that weighs heavy on us, but we don't really get the full grasp of that, but the shame in knowing what you did, that that's enough to to make you think hard about every decision you make. Uh -huh. I mean, we have seen firsthand one bad decision leading to a life of bad decisions leading to your children's lives being horrible because of it. Because of one one bad mistake you made as a as a young person. Right. Good point. And the thing is, even when you repent and you're sorry, the consequences still remain. Still there. God will forgive you. Your, your parents will forgive you, but you still have to walk through the mess you made. Yeah. So it's better not to make the mess to start with. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. Hey, man. As has... <laughs> Everybody says it, but nobody does it. Learn from everybody else's mistakes. I I have not been married, but I have seen quite a few marriages go through. I kind of know the pitfalls. I'm not saying I know them all, but I've got a pretty good idea, and I'm not going through the stuff the other swarming have gone through. Amen. Because I will learn from it. Amen. Yeah, I've never been bitten by a snake, but I've seen pictures of snake bites, and it's bad. Bad. Right? I mean, you're right. We need, we need to observe and learn and not have to try it ourselves. If we can see, you know, somebody else was rebellious and they wanted it their way, what did they, what did they end up? And it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a prideful, haughty way to look at it, but I'm not meaning it this way. Try to do better. Yes. Well, it's not try and try well, no, <laughs> it, 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 people can kind of see it in a, um, uh, what's the word, competitive way. But you have to try to be better. Not that I want to be better than y'all, but I'm going to I try to make better are. decisions. I hope that you are. You know, mm -hmm. and you have to do that. But, but you know, that's such a beautiful point, though, Olivia. It's not... It's not you sitting there, I'm going to be better than them. It's I want to build off of what they did. Because that's the thing, I guess, that, that as a parent drives you crazy when you see your kids doing the identical stupid stuff you did. And you say, man, you are going to have to walk through all the garbage that I walked through. Can you not learn from this and then start at a higher place? It is so, it is so heartbreaking for a parent. When you see a child do that, yeah. but you know, build off of what's already been developed there, and don't and start back down in the pit. I've seen both ends going. You know, I have seen ones that don't follow, and it's just ridiculous. And I see ones that have, and how much more they have progressed than you ever thought they would. Yeah, you know, and the blessings that come when you do it right. Yeah. This. Thank you. <laughs> and she's going to do so much better than all of us. Anybody else got anything to share? Come on, guys. All the girls have done the talking. The guys are ready for lunch. Okay. So you can stop the broadcast. Thank you.